Yo, what's going down, everybody? Welcome to Show Me the Meaning, Wisecracks Movie Podcast. The Meaning! There it is. I'm Austin Hayden. I'm joined by the Show Me the Meaning crew. We've got Helen. What up, what up? And we've got Michael. Hello, I'm happy to be here. That is good. I'm glad that you're happy to be here. I'm happy to be here, even though I'm not sure that this film is something that we're all happy to have to discuss, because I know that it's been... Crit- oh, wait, those faces, I don't know. I'm very curious. Both of those were like cringy faces. Um, we're going to be talking about the newly released Don't Look Up, directed by Adam McKay, starring everybody. That's Leo, <laughs> J-Law, Kate Blanchett, Medea is in it, Timothy Chalamet is in it, Meryl Streep is in it. By the way, that was Tyler Perry, for those of you who don't get the joke. Uh, Jonah Hill is in it, Rob Morgan, Mark Ryland etc 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 um as always we're going to go around and do first impressions and things like that before we start unpacking but before we do i do want to just give a couple of house cleaning remarks one you can follow us on twitter smtm underscore pod that's smtm underscore pod you can also head over to patreon that's patreon.com slash wisecrack and you can get access to some bonus episodes and uh, we've talked about like the philosophy of acting or like what what makes a good acting performance we've talked about good uh, debut features we've talked about a little behind the scenes extra stuff on apocalypse now a bunch of other things so go to patreon.com slash wisecrack as well as i think getting access to all kinds of other goodies so patreon.com slash wisecrack also make sure to check out the other podcast that michael is always uh, on culture binge culture binge um so you can check those those things out and i I keep having to clarify but there is no competition between us um i don't think although i've never been on culture i think there's never been invited well two things one there is one no 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 Ah. i think there's producer-based competition i want to say that Matt, the producer of Show Me the Meaning, and Maddie, the producer of Culture Binge, have a deep-seated hatred that goes back at least three generations. I want to say, Austin, the reason you have not been invited on is due to uh, Australia and nothing else than that. We record okay. early morning uh, America time, and I think it would be not a good time of day for you. Oh, so it was for my well-being? Hey, you know what? I exactly. That's a very good reason. Valid reason. I, uh, yeah, I, I don't want 2 a.m. Austin thoughts. That's dangerous. I, I see what you're <laughs> capable of in those hours, you know? a family show. All right, all right, all right. So go check out all those goodies. Also, we are live right now on YouTube. So if you are listening live on YouTube, hi, welcome, hello. Hi. Um, make sure the, that you comment down below. Give us your thoughts on this film. Um, what do you think about the film and the related issues that it's dealing with, other satires, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's pretty much it. So let's go around and let's do some first impressions. Let's start with Helen. I don't know how many times you've seen this film, but what was your initial kind of interaction with this piece of media. Yeah, so I've seen it twice now. I saw it first when it, like, right when it first came out, because there had been a ton of hype among people who were in the science community about, like, how this is something you, you know, have to see. And then um, I rewatched it today, actually, just to refresh my memory a bit. And I will say I had a different experience each time, but my first, first impression was I was entertained, um, I was kind of in awe of how on the nose it was when it came yeah. to just, uh, you know, it, it didn't, it's one of those things I've seen repeated over and over again where, and I'd love to discuss this with you guys, whether or not this really counts as true satire when it's so, again, on the nose, right? Like, it feels like so many things here aren't really all that exaggerated, obviously, except with, you know, with the exception of the a comet barreling toward the planet um, at this point anyway. But, you know, who knows? 2022 just started. <laughs> so, yeah, that was my first take. OK, Michael, what about you? Seen it twice. Uh, first time I saw it in a, in a movie theater, which was interesting. And I walked out mm-hmm. kind of feeling like it was OK. I liked I liked the ending a little bit. And then I think if okay. anyone listened to the Step Brothers episode, you know this. Uh, I'm a big Adam McKay guy. So. I went into this movie, yes. just to be clear, in case anyone gets mad at me for anything I say later in this podcast, I love Adam McKay. I was so excited about this movie. I wanted it to be great. Upon watching it a mm. second time, I was pretty underwhelmed. Um, I, I think it's a movie that has really big aspirations, and I don't cashes out on many of those aspirations. I think that it thinks it's a satire, but it's not a satire. Um, we can maybe talk about why a little bit later. Um, it is funny at times, but the comedy is all in my mind incidental to the story. And I think that once again, we'll talk more about this. I think a, 
a really good satire. The comedy comes from like the engine of the story and the plot itself. I feel like in this one, all the comedy is like Jonah Hill on the side, a funny bit about the Pentagon chief who charges you $10 for crackers and water. Um, so, so I will say as, as someone who believes that Adam McKay is one of the best comedy filmmakers and one of the best, uh, sort of political satirist of our generation, I, I was pretty disappointed. I think he's capable of, of much better than this. Do you know why your thoughts changed from the first viewing to the second viewing? Like, was it, yeah, was it maybe that you were caught up in the magic of the movie theater the first time or something? Oh, I'm I'm a big theater guy. So you put me in the theater and I'll, I'll <laughs> like almost anything. I think it was a bit of that. And it was like going into it. <laughs> except for, except for Enter the Void. Don't even get and me started. I can say Don't even get me started. I was oh. in the movie theater with Michael when we watched Enter the Void. And about a third of the way through, I just looked over with the friends that we were with. And he had his headphones on and was listening to Bruce Springsteen. 100%. So. I needed Bruce. <laughs> Bruce had to talk me through it. I wasn't never, ready for that level of dark French nihilism. And I was just like, I need to be back in Jersey in the 70s thinking about the plights of the working man when he gets home from Vietnam. Um <laughs> But I will say, yes, I, I was excited in the theater and I went into it being like, this is going to be good. This is going to be great. And I think it took me a bit to be honest with myself. And I do think this is an instance where um, seeing the response to it was helpful. I think so there's some really good criticism written about this film. And also in between my first and second viewings, I, I will say that I think the makers of this film have, have done a poor showing on social media. Mm. Um, in terms of how they have responded to criticism or reactions of the film. If I have one life motto, it's probably act like you've been there before. And the filmmakers did not act as if they had been there before. <laughs> and I just think squabbling with people on Twitter isn't like a best look. Isn't it? Isn't a good look for artists. Mm. But yeah, we maybe talk a little more about that as well. But I think, I think all those factors led to me being underwhelmed on a repeat viewing. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest. I I kind of thought the trailer was fine. Like, I'm not a mm -hmm. big fan of these huge ensemble cast pieces. They don't tend to really hit it out of the park too often. So I really didn't have a ton of crazy expectations. But I was like, oh, I mean, maybe, though, because of the team behind it. And um, I was like, I, I could get excited because I love the big short. I didn't love Vice. Vice was fine. But I loved the big short. So I was like, you know, uh, and I mean, uh, even though McKay isn't the creator and primary engine behind it, Succession is my favorite show on television. So I was like, OK, so this guy knows what he's doing, at least in terms of doing social commentary and satire. And and I thought that it, like, OK, so it would be OK, at least I was thinking, you know, like. I was thinking like three out of five. I was like, yeah, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be fine. Um, and then I saw it and I, I was entertained. The performances are fine. Um, it was okay. But then as I really started to think critically about it, and then actually as I started to watch, I only watched the first half at first, maybe the first two thirds. And I was like, oh, this isn't so bad. Like everyone freaking out online, like all my friends online, people in my, in my kind of like immediate so circle that are like more theory or film um, like intelligent, I would say, like people that I trust their opinions on things, they were fucking like hating this film. And I was like, mm -hmm. damn. But then there were a lot of people that were like, oh, if you hate it, you just don't get it. And like all the scientists were like, hell yeah, this is yeah. a great movie. And then I was like, okay, okay. So I needed to just kind of step away for a bit. And I actually waited like a week before I finished the film. And then I watched the final third of it. And at this point, I kind of put my critical thinking hat on and I started to kind of think through every side that I could. And, um, I, you know, I, I don't think it's a bad film from like a technical perspective, but I, I'm just not sure what, what, what it's for. Like, I don't mm. really enjoy mean spirited satire. And as people might know from this podcast, I don't like idi uh, idiocracy. And the reason I don't like it is because I just think that it is just fundamentally like snooty. And it's just, you know, kind of like a, an artistic liberal putting up his nose at dumb people. And I just don't really think that that's mm -hmm. um, a really interesting form of artistic discourse. Mm -hmm. And I think that this film really suffers from that. And I think that it would have been better. And actually, Michael, you tweeted this. I think it would have been better if they didn't just make the president just this like clear Trumpist kind of inspired figure. Um, and there's a lot of things like that that I just thought were too easy, too easy to lampoon the other while you stand there as the enlightened and the pure. You're the red pilled. You're the pure. You're the enlightened. You're the you're the brilliant. You're the smart. You're the clever. You're the one who has their finger on objective truth. And everybody else just a fucking idiot. So bludgeon them over the head, you fucking idiots. And I just think that that is dogmatic. And ironically, I think it's a really weird 
um, type of religious, pseudo kind of post-religious religiosity that I think is disgusting in popular discourse. And we see it too much. It's just this like center, center left um, American liberal supremacy. And I think it's gross. Um, so part of me is like, ah, it's not a horrible film. And another part of me is like, but the ideology behind it, I think is kind of gross. So I don't know. I don't know. Um, um, I'm excited yeah. to dig you said uh yeah. once we once we get once yeah. we get cruising so that's very interesting also. yeah 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 because there was a lot there so okay so um we want to do a quick recap here for people who either it's been a little while since you've seen it or for people who haven't seen it and they kind of want to get some spoilers but so yeah here we go so um when kate Dibiaski and Dr. Randall Mindy discover an extinction-level comet heading straight for Earth in six months. They seek to warn the White House with the help of the head of NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office, which is, I guess, a real thing, Dr. Teddy Oglethorpe. But President Orlean and her son slash chief of staff are apathetic about it all. So the scientists leak the news to the press and they begin a media campaign to warn of the threat. Now, after Dibiaski loses her cool on a popular morning talk show, her boyfriend denounced is her and Dr. Minning become Dr. Mindy becomes a celeb as the world's sexiest scientist. Now the actual news about the comet's threat receives little public attention and is ultimately denied by the director of NASA. However, when Orlean is involved in a sex scandal with her Supreme Court nominee, she diverts attention and improves her approval ratings by confirming the threat of the comet, announcing a project to strike and divert the comet using nuclear weapons. Now, the mission successfully launches, but Orlean abruptly aborts it when Peter Isherwell, the billionaire CEO of tech company Bash, and another top donor discovers that the comet actually contains trillions of dollars worth of rare Earth elements. So the White House agrees to commercially exploit the comet by fragmenting and recovering it from the ocean using new technology proposed by Bash's Nobel laureates in a scheme that has not undergone scholarly peer review. The White House then hires Dr. Mindy as the national science advisor, and Dibiaski tries to mobilize public opposition to the scheme but gives up under the threat from Orlean's administration. Mindy becomes a prominent voice advocating for the comet's commercial opportunities and begins an affair with popular morning talk show host Evan T. Kate Blanchett in a pretty great role, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, this is the thing. There's so much good in something that maybe isn't all that great. There's some True. really hilarious performances. But, OK, I digress. World opinion is divided among those who demand destruction of the comet, those who decry alarmism and those who believe that mining the comet will create jobs and then those who deny that the comet even exists. Dibiaski returns home to Illinois and begins a fatalistic relationship with Yule, a shoplifter she meets at her retail job. After Mindy's wife confronts him about his infidelity, she returns to Michigan without him. Mindy, becoming angry and frustrated with the administration, ends up having a huge rant on live television and criticizes Orlean for downplaying the impending apocalypse and questioning humanity's indifference. Now, cut off from the administration, Mindy reconciles with Dibiaski as the comet becomes visible from Earth with Mindy, Dibiaski, and Oglethorpe all organizing a protest campaign on social media against Orlean and Bash, telling people to just look up. And then they call on other countries to conduct comet interception operations of their own, which China, India, and Russia agree to do. And so they prepare a joint effort to deflect the comet, but an explosion destroys their spacecraft, leaving Mindy distraught. And then, of course, Bash's attempt, which is to mine the comet for precious resources, also goes awry and everyone realizes that humanity is doomed. Now, Ishuel, Orlean, and others in their elite circle, they board a sleeper spaceship designed to find an Earth-like planet, but they inadvertently leave Orlean's son, Jason, behind. Orlean offers Mindy two places on the ship, but he declines, choosing to spend a final evening with his fami family, Dibiaski, Oglethorpe, and Yule. As expected, the comet hits Earth, causing a worldwide disaster and triggering an extinction-level event. The 2,000 people who left Earth before the impact land on a lush alien planet 22,740 years later, ending their cryogenic sleep. They exit their spacecraft naked and mostly empty-handed, admiring the hab habitable world, uh, but Orlean is quickly killed and eaten by an alien creature as others of its kind surround the humans. Now, apparently, there's also a post credit scene, but I didn't see it, so I had to hear about it online. But in the post credit scene, Jason emerges from the rubble, the rubble because he survives the comet, and he screams for his mother and tries to post on social media using his phone. You know what? I, I didn't know. Truly. I, I thought the I thought the after whatever scene is when she gets eaten by the Bronto rock. No, so yeah, yeah there's that whole one at the end. Watch that now. He's like the last wow. the uh, last man standing. He, that changes everything. Rubble. Ten out of ten. Two yeah. thumbs up. Loved it. 
10 out of 10. <laughs> All right. So we're going to start peeling this thing apart. But before we do, I've got to give a quick shout out to our sponsor at Skillshare. Look, you all know the deal. If you listen to this podcast, you know, I'm a fan of Skillshare. I've used it for some really cool design classes on like UX and UI and digital design and things like that. And also for like how to wed together your interests in design and activism. So you can go to Skillshare.com slash SMTM and you'll actually get a free trial of their premium membership where you can get involved not only in just the classes, but you can also get involved in this community where you can connect with other like-minded people and creatives and, of course, where you can explore things that you're passionate about. And um, they offer thousands of classes too, so it's not just things like that I just mentioned, but pretty much anything that you can think of creatively, uh, creatively, they're going to offer classes for. So um, iPhone photography, drone filming, editing, how to make better TikTok videos – et cetera, et cetera. I mean, if you're a a knitter, if you're a painter, if you want to use watercolors, if you want to use oil things, if you want to do digital stuff, whatever, Skillshare has classes that will be perfect for you. So if you want to explore your creativity and you want to connect with some cool people, go to Skillshare.com slash SMTM and you'll get a free trial of the premium membership. That's Skillshare.com slash SMTM or click the link down below. All right. Let's start unpacking some things. The good with the bad. Let's start with what we like. Let's do like a compliment sandwich. Okay. So Helen, what do you, what do you like about this? Leonardo DiCaprio. I thought (laughs) his performance was fantastic. I thought he nailed that role. Um, You know, there's some actors who are so big that no matter, you know, when you see them in something, you just, you think of them as that actor. Like I thought he truly just blended into the role of Dr. Mindy. And, um, I just really enjoyed his performance. I thought it was great. So that's my plus one. What about you guys? What do you got? Michael, give us a yeah, give us I a mean, compliment. Yeah, I mean, some great performances. Um, I got to hear Timothy Chalamet say, he's got your face on his fucking board, <laughs> um, which was one of the best. Uh, Mark Rylance, his performance as Peter Ishwell, insane. Oh, Such that, so like, good. I kind of, like, you know, you you see Mark Rylance in most things, and he's like a British theater actor dude, yeah. and he's often in yeah. prestige things or like BBC produced uh, dramas that take place in the early 20th yeah. century, whatever it might be. I think he did something really weird and fun with his Peter Isherwell character, and in my mind, that's the part of the film that was relatively successful: the um, skewering of the narcissistic tech CEO type, definitely, and I think the way in which. They they showed that for that person who I think is like a hyperbolic hi- mixture of a like a Bezos and a Musk, um, I think the film does a good job of showing a how intertwined those folks' power is with government power, and b um, how sort of cosmically narcissistic the underlying intentions and motives of these people yep. are. Um, so I thought mm. that was really great. And then I will say I, I I think the final you know the Last Supper scene. I found beautiful because I, I, I like things that, mm. that deal with, with hopelessness in a hopeful way. Mm. And I don't know. I, I was kind of moved by that, this idea. And, you know, if you're listening this far, spoilers, um, <laughs> that at the end of the world, these people are just sitting around a table with the people they love, eating store-bought apple pie, drinking mm. the coffee that, uh, you know, Dr. Um, Mindy ground himself. And, you know, there's a line where uh, Leo's character says, you know, we really had it all, didn't we? Yeah. And mm-hmm. I think there's something, you know, melancholic and, and nice about that. So I, I think that was a strong point. Um, Austin, how about you? Put some put some stuff in the sandwich of praise. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Leo's performance, I actually turned to my partner at one point and I was like, look, despite any sort of criticisms, he's just fucking great so in good. everything. He's you know? just incredible. Like in everything. Yeah. Yeah, he's just... He's I'll, I'll say it. He, he might be a good actor. He might be, he might <laughs> be a good guy. He might be pretty good. He really is. And and I almost feel like... And, and this, I, I don't know. I'm, maybe this is too shitty. I almost feel like his talents were kind of wasted on a project that kind of falls a little flat for me because mm. he's so earnest, like just in his own personal life, too, with environmental causes. Right. right. And, and his role is is very earnest, even even when he's kind of caught up in things, you know, yeah. he's caught up in it because he's like, oh, shit, I'm kind of like this nerdy scientist and people like think I'm yeah. like hot and I'm desirable now. Right. Like I, I can get that, right? Like yeah. there's ego there. And then and then ultimately I think even he feels like that he got trapped in his sins, so to speak. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I feel like there the the kind of journey that his character goes on is is really lovely 
played, but I feel like it just, I don't know. It's like he's not going to get any love for it. And I don't know that mm-hmm. his talents were fully utilized in, in um, this. Um, and it kind is, of, is, this it, the, is this the first yeah. movie he's done since Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Yeah. So. Yeah. Right? Let's say, okay, never so. mind. But yeah, I just think that's very <laughs> interesting that he kind of came off the bench for this. Mm. I mean, yeah, yeah. and he got hooked in. I he's got that the environmental stuff for sure. But go ahead. Sorry, Austin. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. I, you know, the, the kind of climactic scene, I think, for his character is when he has that rant on live television. Right. Mm-hmm. Which is just very reminiscent of, you know, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And, um, you know, uh, kind of old satires and things like that that have that have existed. And and I felt like he was channeling a lot of that energy, which was kind of like a nice nod, but maybe also a little bit derivative as well. You know, but 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 I just it, I, I felt like that that scene, even though like from a technical perspective, like he's fucking fantastic. Right. Like he's great. And and you see the pain on his face and the desire and the sort of like helplessness. And I love the bit when he's like, look, we don't always have to be so fucking pleasant all the time. Right. And I kind of like that, you know, right. um, mm-hmm. I liked that scene a lot. I just don't know that in the scope of the whole project, it has the gravitas that I wish it would have had, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so that's like everything that I say is going to be like a positive. But like even in that positive, it's probably I'm kind of like, oh, I just I don't know. I didn't I didn't love um I mean, I, all the performances I would say I, I oh, loved, yeah. except I didn't know that I don't know that I to, to now go into like a critique. I don't know if I, I loved the Jonah Hill character. And here's the reason why. Like, I thought he was funny. And I heard him say that he was like he wanted to be like the fire festival personified, yeah. which right. is pretty fucking funny. He does. not I like I like him saying that more than I liked seeing it. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? I wanted I to punch him in the face the whole time. It made it almost <laughs> killed the movie for me at some points because I was like, this is overboard obnoxious. Um, and it was detracting. Yeah, it felt a little push. Detracting from it's yeah. like he was in a different movie a little bit. Yeah. Like he was in he was in yeah. like an older Adam McKay comedy or a side character in a Judd Apatow movie when they were trying to do something a little more serious. Although, you know, Boy with the Dragon Tattoo is pretty funny. And when they have the launch and he says, "I, I timed it perfectly," my Molly's peaking. I found that yeah. very funny. <laughs> that that uh, was funny. He apparently improved a lot of that too. I was you know uh, listening to an interview and he that. A lot of the stuff with Jennifer Lawrence, he just kind of like, you know, pulled out um, the whole the whole thing where he says a prayer to stuff, which I didn't enjoy in the first round. But on the second, oddly, I appreciated more. Um, that was, I yeah. think, if I recall, was improv as well. But um, yeah, funny no, I, funny he is funny. Definitely. Definitely a funny Real guy. quick, I want to I want to give a shout out. Uh, we got we got a comment from uh, a, a couple of comments in the chat. Um, yeah, Star Fury says, "Give this movie Academy Award of the Century." Drop wow. the mic. Awesome oh. film. Awesome, awesome film. Okay. I hope we're not stepping on your toes. I hope you're not like super angry, but keep commenting in the chat below and let yeah. us know why you think it's an awesome, awesome film. Also, um, Aman Ahmad said, "Hey, can you give my dad a shout out, Doctor <laughs> Afa Ahmad?" He created this thing called the Ahmad Cohen algorithm, and I am currently looking at a paper from 1973 by Dr. Ahmad and Dr. Cohen called the Numerical Integration Scheme for the N-Body Gravitational Problem. Now, I am not a a scientist, but there is – I'm looking – it's – it's a physics paper from the Journal of Computational Physics from 1973. So, uh, Dr. Ahmad, as, Dr. as a Ahmad. fellow academic, shout out to you. Um, Hell yeah. Holler awesome. in the house. Thank you for your contribution Ooh. to the scientific community. Um, yeah. So let's keep going here. Other, other, <laughs> let's think, let's think, let's think about the film, like just like without going into like the, the kind of cultural stuff, like let's still think about it technically, you okay. know, and, like performances or like scenes that we like, things mm. that we liked. What did they do? Well, what, what else besides Leo's performance? Can we give some praise? Speaking for? of doctor or not doctor, Peter Ishuel, that scene where they're in the hangar, you know, looking at the, at mm-hmm. the box, right. Or whatever they were at the beads. Um, you know, and he goes oh, yeah. into that whole thing about like, you know, he's sitting there being like, well, I don't know about the science behind this. And he's like, don't you know that I can see into your brain and when you're going to die and how you will. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, this is pretty true to lot. Like I, that was an exam, you know, a satirical moment that I felt really, really worked. Um, I loved that scene actually, because I think that, you know, that's just, that is you know, the nature of the relationship between the scientific community and, you know, these like tech gods, right? Where it's like, whenever somebody's like, well, wait a second, I don't know that that kind of like, maybe we should think about it before we put this, you know, 
a like you know self driving car on the road. It's like, do you know all of these things that like I have done? You know, like wielding this. Uh, you know, I I guess yeah. I just loved that scene. I thought it was really well done. Well, there is like Helen a god like science a person. god like power, yeah right yeah wait yeah wait. wasn't it like for, for Helen as a scientist for Austin as an academic there's an interesting thematic throughout where they kept talking about peer review I've never seen a blockbuster film that talks that uses the term peer yeah. review so much is it peer mm. review do we do peer review do they even get peer review there yeah. they have peer review yeah, yeah. and uh, there was something kind of fun about that and I think you know the scene you talk about Helen as well where the character says you know businessman you think you're a businessman yeah. and he says this is, this is the next evolution of humanity yes. um now real quick i just want to burst a little bit of the peer review bubble for people out there oh, no. a lot of peer review is bros in science oh, yeah. citing each other oh, yeah. and getting credits because especially in science um where they are doing multiple co-authored papers like six seven eight nine ten co-authors a lot of it not all of it and i'm not saying that that necessarily invalidates it per se, but a lot of it is just homies citing homies to get publication credits and you know, so that doesn't necessarily mean that the science is bad in what they're investigating, but it definitely does mean that what they're investigating isn't always the whole story. It's just that they're trying to kind of prop each other up and that's partly because the academic game is kind of shitty in some other ways that requires, yep. you know, citations and things like that. So a lot of it is just kind of like Hey, let's just help help out friends. Not always, right. not always, mm -hmm. but right. we don't need to think of peer review as being like this holy thing yeah. that is like gonna somehow get us out of any problems. Well, so part yeah. of me thought that like the writers of the film, because you know, it was Adam McKay and David Sirota came up with the story, neither of them are scientists. And you got a little bit of that like fetishizing science from non scientists that like scientists are magic, peer review is magical, they speak only <laughs> truth. Yeah. So well, it's kind of funny that there wasn't a lot of Oh, we're only supposed to be saying good things, so never mind. I, 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 it was, it was I'll just say it was interesting the way yeah. that science was treated from the way they talked to, to Ariana Grande singing, like, just listen to the motherfucking scientist um, at the end. This this is a movie that likes science and wants to let you know that it likes science. <laughs> but, 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 I will say that there were some, I don't know that it was fully just listen to the experts as much as a lot of the... <sighs> you know, criticisms of this film have said. Like, for example, right, like, uh, Dr. Mindy gets caught up in, you know, the, the, the for-profit, you know, thing with the, with the, uh, with the, you know, movement to blow up the thing and mine, the comet and mine the metals, right? And that's a, you know, looking at, like, just inherently trusting the experts without understanding, like, where their, you know, motivations really come from. I do think the film did do a good job at least of touching on that. I think it was mm -hmm. a little bit idealistic and seeing him just completely turn his back and decide that he was going to, you know, just shun the right, like the, the corporate, I guess the folks that are, you know, running the whole thing. But I guess for me, I, I liked that. I liked that, that there was that little bit of conflict, a little bit of contradiction there that I think that like maybe didn't make it. So it, it muddled the message, right. Which is yeah. a criticism of mine. If this makes sense, Sorry, I'm rambling a little bit, but yeah, yeah. I'm like kind of trying to find the words here. It's like there was kind of this contradiction that I think is inherent also in the way that we do science um, and in the, the motivations for those who, you know, claim to be pure when they say that, you know, this is how things are. Right. Um, but, you know, and my on the flip side, like I said, that does result in a somewhat muddled message, which we can talk about later. But you guys yeah. know what I'm saying here? Like. I I yeah. think so, and and maybe, I, I don't even know if this was intentional or not, but maybe if we can even push that even further, that whole Ariana Grande concert to me was so cringy and oh so weird yeah. that I kind of even thought, like, maybe what, what we can take from this is that even if we trust the scientists that are, like, the good scientists that have the pure motive, like, even if we trust them, they're still going to be fucking cringy and weird, and it's still not going to be able to be packaged in a way that is consumable because all we can do is get, like, a pop star to sing about it with really dumb lyrics and, like, derivative music, and, like, that's the best we can do, which to me then was, like, a really kind of cynical and almost, like, fatalistic part of the film for me because I was like, oh, great, so, like, even even if these science crusaders did have a platform, 
that's the best that they can do. Like that's the, that's what the world is. So for me, then it made me think, oh, our world is just fucked. Not because we don't listen to scientists at like an individual perspective, but because we don't, we're just, we don't even have the mechanisms in place to communicate at all. Anything. Precisely. Precisely. And that's something that I liked about this film, which I think is much more, you know, and, and again, I know we should be talking about technical stuff and the performance and that kind of thing. But I think just to add this in here really quickly, I think that if you step away from it and look, don't look at it as, you know, this is a film that is strictly a metaphor for climate change or whatever, right? Like, and you look at it as more of about existential risk in general and kind of a thought experiment as to how we deal with that rather than trying to label it as pure satire, pure anything, then I, I appreciate it a lot more through that lens, if that makes sense. Because yep. that, that gives leeway for its message to be a little bit muddled because things are not as simple as they, you know, they're not, they're not as simple as they often are made out to be in film and stories in general. Right. So I yeah. think, yeah. But Michael, yeah, I, I listen until it's time to get a little bit critical. I'm going to keep. It's time yeah. to get a little bit critical. <laughs> Nothing else. Okay. Well, I'll, right. I'll say this then. And I, I'm glad we had the discussion about the science because that is important. I, okay. I like satire as a form. I'll, and I'll get to the movie. The reason I like satire as a form is because I find it to be one of the most philosophical forms of uh, storytelling, filmmaking, writing. You know, satire emerges or gets popping around the same time that philosophy gets popping. And like, you know, Greece, Athens, all that sort of stuff. Obviously, in Aristophanes, the clouds were, were satirizing both Athens and Socrates to an extent. And there's a thing I love. I'm going to get nerdy for 30 seconds and I'll, I'll back away then. In Soren Kierkegaard's doctoral dissertation on the concept of irony, he talks about how he thinks that Aristophanes' portrayal of Socrates as this ironic comic figure is actually way more accurate. Why? Because a part of what, you know, philosophers and critical thinkers do is use the and the comic to point out the absurdity of the reality and engage in such a way that it provokes people to see the world differently. And in my mind, that's what, what good philosophy should do. It should provoke me so I see the world differently, and it's what good satire should do. And I just think this movie had such a to do some of those things, and I think it does none of those things. So all the good things we could say about this movie, and there are good things, it is not a good or ineffective satire. And I think that, like, it's because it doesn't provoke, right? Like, none did, did either of you? watch that movie and think like really gotta think about about stuff differently like the way i think about science or politics or power or whatever like did it, did it change your mind nah, you think the only thing was like who am i gonna hang out with at the end of the world right like who do i want around my last supper table and steve like, carell and Karen Knightley already made that movie right. uh what Find, it was steve carell already made that movie i think it's called right. like finding a friend <laughs> at the end of the world came out like 10 years ago right uh, right right no Go but on. so that's what i wonder like the people watching this movie on Netflix are largely people who are already like climate change is real. Scientists are good. Um, those type of, of politicians are bad. And then no one who, who to be frank is like a, you know, rural Trump voter is going to watch this movie and be like, well, I'm thinking of stuff differently. Cause it portrays that crowd of people is either like money hungry ghouls or just like dumb hicks who like literally don't want to look at the sky um, and there's the scene where right. they're at a rally right. and one right. of the people who's portrayed as like Jonah Hill calls them like dumb rednecks looks up and is like, gosh, darn it. There, there is a comet in that sky. You've been lying right. to us. And it's just like, what do you, is this you trying to show like empathy to those characters? So I don't know. I made the comment that Austin had referenced on Twitter where I, I, was, I was thinking, even if you do something as simple as like make the politicians like good liberals. And, you know, this is why, in terms of good satire, this is why Veep works. Because in the show Veep, mm -hmm. the power-hungry ghouls aren't, you know, <laughs> the conservatives that in the media we often think of as bad. The ghoul in Veep is a, like, strong, feminist, liberal woman. The type of thing that in, like, society we, 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 we turn into, like, angelic figures. And Veep is, is like, yeah, but what if those people are evil too? too and what does that do like get out uh, another very good satire right. you know the the parents and get out like we have that bradley whitford line you know I'd, I'd vote for obama a third time if i could we see how these <laughs> ideal white family they're the bad guys and if you watch get out as a liberal you should walk out of that movie thinking like ooh, like right. obviously i'm not like doing brain swapping but in which right. ways am i benefiting off racism or fetishizing communities of color or whatever it is and I just think this movie failed to provoke. And 
any interesting okay. or challenging? I'm going to yeah. say something really like kind of like postmodern, cultural, relativistic, woo wooey here. Another shitty thing about the whole just trust science narrative is that it really disregards indigenous thought, spiritual thought, so much of oh, what yeah. it means to be human by reducing it to certain forms of quantified rationality. Totally. Um, there's there's a book called Galileo's Error by Philip Goff, who's a philosopher of science. Um, he's a, a big proponent of something called panpsychism. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that he argues in this book, Galileo's Error, is that he says that, look, when Galileo started to institute this new type of uh, examination where we can quantify reality, he first made a philosophical decision. And that philosophical decision was that <clears throat> consciousness is not something that can be analyzed in these ways. So so let's kind of just hold it aside for a second and let's only look at things that are measurable under these very kind of strict parameters. And in so doing, what he did is he set up an entire paradigm, but based on first a decision, a choice, a philosophical move, rather than it being something that just kind of like organically came out of, oh, this is how truth is discovered, which mm -hmm. is I think what a lot of people think when we hear like, trust the science, trust the science, like somehow mm -hmm. it's this like thing that dropped out of the heavens and into our laps. And it's this new way of looking at the world. But historically, people were just dummies because they thought that God sent the rains, right? right? Rather than trying to understand other elements of ecological integration, like one of the things that I think is really potent here in Australia is this real effort to turn our attentions to indigenous forms of environmental sustainability that are now being integrated by the scientific community because they're like, oh shit, I guess these people had something. They had some <laughs> knowledge that if you do controlled burns, then that prevents these massive bushfires from getting out of control. Or they look at these like settlements that have been built for thousands and thousands of years that uh, were integrated to the environment and that were a give and a take that didn't just exploit and plunder that was like, oh, actually, maybe that's actually more quote unquote scientifically in the terms of it just being knowledge. Maybe that's actually a better scientific model, right? So the whole point of like, just, just trust science, trust science is actually, and I'm going to throw out some super, super, like maybe hyperbolic terms. It's actually kind of culturally supremacist. And it may yeah. be even like a part of this Western uh, European patriarchal system that we've inherited. And I just don't like it. I yeah, just, I just think it. that I'm yeah, going for it. I just it. think that it's icky. I just think it's icky yeah. and it just reeks of like dogmatism. And as somebody who has fought the last 15 years of his life to resist dogmatism in all of its forms, when I see it, I'm real sensitive to it. And I don't know. I just feel yeah. bleh. I would say it. the closest the film gets to acknowledging the tiniest, tiniest bit of what you're saying um, is early on when they, when, when uh, uh, DiBiaschi are sort of marginalized for being from Michigan State. And, mm -hmm. and they need <laughs> right, to bring right. in some like yeah, Ivy right. League guys. Uh, so you get that sense at least that like science isn't some isn't per, isn't perceived as some system of objective knowledge because it's numbers, right? They're doing database things, but it's like, no, but we need the Ivy League guys to get the numbers because there's still a sort of, you know, class based system of how we how we perceive knowledge. So, right. That's right. Yeah. I don't yeah. Okay. With I, I do okay. want to say so. Raymond, Raymond, uh, you know, of the show, um, who wasn't able to make it today, sent me a message, and he just asked me that if I get a chance, if I could also share his two cents on the film. So this kind of fits into what we're talking about. So it's kind of perfect. Wow. He said, um, he said, I thought it was bad, <laughs> and <laughs> that makes said, you think. And yeah, mm -hmm. and I would recommend First Reformed. And Silent Night, ah. if folks are interested in more grounded, human, and funny takes on the climate crisis. I, I yeah. nothing to say other than agreed. Although there was a good satire that Leo Nardo DiCaprio was actually in after this. Um, it was more of a performance art piece where um, in the context of promoting this film, he decided to spend New Year's on a power yacht that emits more than like a family of four every mile it goes where he hung out with Jeff Bezos, a character the Peter Isherwell character was literally based on. Um, and I found that to be a fun satirical moment um, that he was performing to show the contradictions of, I guess, performative activism and, and lifestyle stuff and class allegiance. So shouts to Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, uh, the he Andy was making company. deals. Yeah. He was making deals yeah. with uh, with with Isherwood or <laughs> whatever his name was. 
Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even yeah. put this movie in the same like category as something like First Reformed. It's just so different, you know. So even that, and the writing is so, in my opinion, so exceptional in that movie. But um, I haven't seen Silent Night, but I've read about Me either. it. Either. Okay. Yeah. Is this a, is that a random no, it, horror it, movie where it's a which was it's a spooky allegory? I think that's why I've yeah. Not seen it's it. like there's like this this family, this British family, they're having like a dinner party and like oh, they invite people over, yeah, yeah. but it's like. Right. But the, the tagline is like, no matter the fun and games and things that are happening inside, like that can't like change the horrors that are taking place outside yeah. or something like that. Well, and, and that along the lines of comic based movies, I would say a, a film to add to Raymond's list that I think explores at least the existential implications of human annihilation would be, um, oh, oh, Melancholia. Uh, Melancholia. Which is a real great film that gets it. I mean, it's a whole movie about like the last five minutes. Of what Don't Look Up is about, basically. Um, right. Yeah. I, I have a question for either of y'all. Do you think, and, and maybe this is me trying to be fair to the filmmakers. Are we, well, no, and I'll say this before I say we should be fair to the filmmakers. They made an official website that's all about climate change. The filmmakers themselves have a website they made with Netflix that's like, use better light bulbs. Okay. But are we putting too much onto the film by reading it through this lens of climate change? Because, um, and there was, a good article i forget the the the, the author uh, the baffler wrote a kind of critical review of don't look up in which the author basically just said like a comet's a bad allegory for climate change a comet is one thing that happens all at once whereas climate mm. change is something that's a multifaceted phenomenon that involves every different aspect of human life has been happening for hundreds of years and any solution to it isn't just like shoot a missile at the rock it's a complicated thing that involves how we consume, how we spend, our politics, our science, all this sort of stuff. So I guess is the, should we be reading this film as just like a general commentary on how as people we react to crises? Uh, Helen, what do you think? That's Yeah, that's what I was attempting to articulate earlier is that I think that – um, and, and I've heard this plenty of times, right? I have, a, you know, one of my very good friends, Emma, shout out to her. She's a longtime Wisecrack fan and listener of this podcast, pointed out that, like, you know, this really falls apart if you just look at the comet as a stand-in for climate change, right? Because mm -hmm. happens all at once. Uh, you know, j it's, it's something that there's a very clear solution to and, you know, blow it up, right? Um, whereas climate change is multifaceted. I think that I, I see that, right? And I've heard that other places before as well. But I think that it's it's boxing the film in, and I think we're giving you know as I said before I think you I I personally look at it um, through the lens of existential risk in general and how we respond to existential risk right and then I appreciate it much more right because just if you just look at it strictly through the lens of climate change I mean foundationally speaking the comet is a not a great metaphor, <laughs> right? It's yeah. hyperbolic intentionally, perhaps, but it's not just strictly a good metaphor, right? Um, and it's yeah. and that's, that's COVID the fuck problem, them, right? Be but, oh, well, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, just going to quickly say, like, I know they conceived of this film before COVID happened, and I think we would perceive yeah. this movie way differently if we didn't have two years of politicians around the world screaming, believe science, believe science, trust the scientist. So it sort of front loads how, how at least I perceive Stuff. There's a lot of attached to that now. So and, if only COVID whole, wouldn't have happened, this movie could yeah. have been better. Right. And I want to add to that because I, I was <laughs> listening to this podcast. Um, you know, they you know, they made like a whole six part series, right? Like about the podcast or not. I'm sorry, about the film, right? About the making of it. Um, and if I recall correctly, they got done, you know, like McKay got done writing this like a month before COVID hit. Right. And then they did some rewriting as things kind of kept, you know, getting mm -hmm. exponentially crazier. And so that's why I think we see this show up. I wonder what that very first draft looked like, right? And perhaps then we would have, you know, it may not have fallen as flat, right? Because we would have had yeah. a different relationship with the film. But go ahead, Austin. That's why I don't even know that this film is about climate change yeah. so much as it is just about like, hey, what are we going to as a community, as a human community, what's going to be the form of rationality that governs us? Right. Is it going to be religious mystification? No. Is it going to be certain like political ideology? No. It's going to be the rationality of science. And that's what mm. this film is all about, which I find very strange mm. coming from an artist, right? Like, I find that that when art and science, maybe they're not, like, non-overlapping magisteria or something like that, but I almost feel like fucking, like, scientistic 
art is like I don't know like there's something about art that is supposed to be transcendent that is beautiful that is poetic that is that breaks the bounds of that which is easily quantifiable like for me when it's good mm -hmm. art anyway and my part of my whole problem with like the digitization of art and the digitization of distribution is that it's becoming scientified mm. for lack of a better term you know it's the quantification of um human imagination the quantification of desire the quantification of romance and love and and hope and despair and, and fear and all of those things that I just it, to me that takes all mystery out and then it's not art anymore then it is just something else mm -hmm. something that's quantified enclosed explained um, and, and and so I, there's this weird relationship so I think that's really what the film is about and just to, to give a shout out to our amazing producer Matt he wrote up this little doc for us yeah. with some uh, great things. There was a um, a review of the film, a critique of the film from Psychology Today that said this film fails at a com as a comedy because it's not really satire. This stuff actually happened, and we all experienced it with COVID. <laughs> so it's it's just not that funny. Maybe it would have hit harder in 2005, but in 2022 it falls flat. And I right. think I think so much of of kind of like the film's impetus to be like, hey, the form of rationality that should govern politics, society. Society, family, et cetera, et cetera, is the scientific form of rationality. I find it very kind of strange, um, but I think that really that's that's the message of the film. And because, like Michael just said, we've been hearing it for two years, and we have our own sexiest doctor in the world or sexiest scientist in the world, Dr. Fauci. Like, like Fauci. I almost, I, I almost was like, did this film get written after? 2020 and 2021, when Fauci was yeah. viewed as like the well, sexiest, like well. he was literally. Wasn't he yeah. literally declared like the sexiest he was sure by People magazine said. or something? I was also yeah. over and don't look up like the ninth time someone said about Leonardo DiCaprio. He's actually attractive. It's like, we get it. You took a really handsome actor yeah. and you scruffed him up and he like has a Midwestern accent, which makes him inherently ugly or something. Right? Also, shouts That's to Lord. shouts to Melanie Linsky, who plays his wife, who's one of the yes. best yes. actors in the game. God, she's um, wonderful. I love her. Yeah. And she's great in it. Um, cool. But yeah, and there's to continue to heap praise on producer Matt and the rundown doc as well. He put a letter to the editor. Someone wrote from the LA times um, that, that compared it to a modest proposal, the Jonathan Swift essay, essay about how we should sell Irish babies. Um, and I think the big difference, right between don't look a modest proposal is a modest proposal, like scandalized people. People read a modest proposal in the 18th century. Mm. And they're like, Oh my God, he thinks yeah. we should actually sell human lives to which his point is like, that's basically already what you're doing and you're scandalized. <laughs> <laughs> right? right. And I think that like, and that's why it's good satire. Um, yeah. It's movie, provocative. Yeah. Like you said. Just, yeah. It's not scandalous. It's not provocative. Right. Um, right. Maybe right. this is some though. And if it is like truly, 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 if people are watching this film and it is provoking them to think differently about any type of large scale crisis, crisis or, or collapse, ecological or other, then that is an objectively good thing. However, art and propaganda are, are different. I think, mm. you know, it might be a good piece of propaganda. And I think this is why the reaction to it is so weird, where scientists are like, this movie's mm -hmm. great. Media people mm -hmm. that write about the climate are like, this is the best movie I've ever seen. Film critics, whose job it is to watch and write about movies with a critical lens, are just like, you know what? The movie doesn't work. Yeah. And the, the people are like, oh, so you don't believe in climate change? It's like, no. Right. It, it's it's a good piece of propaganda, and it's maybe not a good piece of art. And that's okay, everyone. Yeah, that's okay, right? right? <laughs> That's yeah. People don't like this movie because it's hilarious or because it is good satire, right? They like it because it makes them feel seen. Like that is the like by yeah. and large the response I think has been to this movie, where not even just climate scientists, right? Like, <laughs> like you know, you go to like the nursing subreddit, and everybody's quoting this movie all the time. Like, oh my god, I've never so felt so seen as when like Leonardo DiCaprio starts screaming that we're all gonna die, right? Because they feel like they're screaming this every day of their lives. That is what ultimately is that I think is is why people latch onto this movie. But it's you're you are correct. It is not because it's great art. <laughs> also, so the main thing I learned today is that Helen goes on the nursing subreddit for funsies. I do. Uh, I spend so much time on Medit 
I spent, <gasps> wait, that's where I spent all my social media time is doom scrolling, seeing what doctors are saying about COVID. So, um, but, but yeah, but they, but, but truly like healthcare workers really do feel like this movie speaks to them because they have from, you know, all this time have just been feeling they're screaming into the void about how bad things are. Right. And climate scientists too say the same thing, but yeah, it's yeah. not because it's. And that's good though. Right. Yeah. It's good that it makes those people feel affirmed and seen. It's good that it makes like tenured Midwestern science professors be like, Hey, I'm in a movie. Um, yeah. <laughs> but none of those things, it's like, right. you could be like a bobsledder. And when cool runnings came out, you were like, wow, our community hasn't been represented. It's so good. They made a movie about bobsledders, right. but doesn't make it like citizen Kane because you too like to bobsled. Yeah. Although I guess that's more, <laughs> right. as much, but yeah. yeah, no. Yeah. That was one of the other things that I did think about too, is, is I have just been around too many academics for too long maybe. <laughs> yeah. And I just know that they are like clamoring. They just are loving that they're, they're, they're like, that's right. I am Leonardo DiCaprio. I could be, they're like, I could be the sexiest scientist in the world. If only they would listen to me. Like my, my, my essay that I wrote, my discovery, that's the thing that's going to change the world. And if only I had that platform, then I too would be on the cover of people. And I'd be having an affair yeah. with a really hot talk show host. And and I'm like, oh, you I and Rachel Maddow like, would be in cahoots. <laughs> Oh, I know, I know, I know. Okay, so as in, in, in any compliment sandwich, uh, you do a compliment, and then you do a little bit of a critique, and then you you send them out the door with a, hey, thank you. Um, so go. what's the bottom? What's the bun? Uh, if we did the meat of the critique and the top bun of compliment, what's like a final compliment that we would say about this film? Um, Helen, you got anything else here? Hmm. Because I feel like Helen, you might you might have a little bit more love for the film. I feel like Michael and I have been a little bit more. I do. Angry I appreciate it because I think it it. I again, you know, I. My biggest struggle with this movie was that I don't think the message was clear. I don't. I I personally don't think it was just trust the experts because again, you have that that uh, moment of, you know, not just moment, but you have, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio siding with, right, like with the corporations, you know, we uh, talked about this earlier. I think like, I don't think it, I think it has nuance that has been underappreciated, right? Like that is, that's my thing with the film. Do I think it's, you know, just like provocative if you don't consider that nuance? No, I don't think it is, right? But I think that if it's, you know, if you go through the screenplay and you look at the the fact that like the evolution of especially of Dr. Mindy, I think that there is, there is more to it than it's getting credit for. Right. Um, I mean, you know, but, but that's that I think again, right. Like if it's not provocative to the people that it should be provocative to, does it matter? Right. It's got a muddled message. Um, where was I going with that? I don't even know. You know, I, I guess the, the other thing I liked about it was, um, I think it just is a superficial thing, but like, you know, the shot, like just the comet and the, the beauty in the comet and how it's come barreling towards them and they're looking up. I think like on the second watch, I was more emotional than the first watch. I actually laughed in the second watch and I cried. The first one, I was just like, holy shit. But um, on the second watch, you know, it was just those scenes where they're looking up at the comet and it's coming towards them and the end is nigh. I, I loved it. Yeah, I loved Those that. played a lot better in a theater. Because the comet looked a lot bigger, whereas rewatching it on TV, I was like, "Oh, it's pretty small." I didn't have anything to compare it. To. <laughs> yeah. I had no. Well, but maybe that's the point: yeah. is that it doesn't have to be like a melancholia sized planet, but that it even just because it's what like like seven nine kilometers, kilometers wide. I think is eventually where we nine end up. Kilometers. It starts as between five and ten. The final number they give us in the film is nine. So it's nine kilometers, which isn't that. I mean, that's big. Yeah. But like, you wouldn't think that that would destroy our mm. life on this planet, you know? But yeah. yeah. Um, I, Michael, I'll leave do, you my, have, do you have a compliment, yeah. Bun? I have a positive thing. There's a line in the film that I really like. Um, this is the part of the film where Leonardo DiCaprio decides to stick with the government. J Law's, her, her, her head's in a bag. She's going off the grid. Dr. Oglethorpe, played by Rob Morgan, is walking away. And, um, you know, Leo is kind of like, what am I supposed to do? And, and Oglethorpe, played by Rob Morgan, says, a man's always got choices, Randall. Sometimes you just got to mm. choose the good one. And I thought that was great. A really good line and a really great moment exploring this, this false either or between I either work with the bad guys or I do nothing. Yeah. And, and I think that was a really great moment. Totally. I'm going to I'm going to finish um, my thoughts before we kind of just do a couple also 
like maybe a fun thing afterwards too. By the way, uh, courtesy of Dude Abides in the chat, um, we'll we'll do a little fun thing after we finish this here. But um, I want to say one thing, a really critical thing, and then I'll take my positive takeaway from this. So um, there's a great there's a great uh, online film um, criticism and film review site called Electric Ghost. If you're not familiar with this, everybody, but the founding uh, the founder and editor of it is a, a guy named David, and he did not like the film. He said. I've maintained that Adam McKay is an artless, supercilious hack since the big short and have, been vindi- and have been vindicated, but his films are at least useful for providing direct access to the inveterate imagination of the milquetoast liberal in all of its arrogance and bad faith. Damn. So Burn. this is that that was that was like really flames being thrown. And I actually, I don't, I don't think that, especially the last part about how his films are at least useful for providing direct access to the inveterate imagination of the milquetoast liberal. This is my positive thing on this. I think that's actually kind of a good thing, though. And the reason I think it's a good thing is at least we're getting, like, like, at least we can speak out and be like, hey, there's this problem of the us v them politics when you stand in like this position of the pure when actually if we really take a critical lens the sort of center left political regime that dominates much of the western world is problematic in so many ways because of its political economic alliances because of the strategies that it's using for green investment to just make more billionaires by transitioning to quote unquote sustainable technologies or whatever those solutions i think are all so problematic and i think what this film does is even though obviously it critiques the kind of like the bash model of um kind of trying to use an economic approach that um it didn't really give us kind of another lens into okay so what's like the progressive approach that might not necessarily be great for developing communities or that might not be great for indigenous and first nations peoples around the world um i think at least it kind of presents us with okay these are the people who do have a lot of control over the media messaging and things like that Mm. and i think it's good for us to be like okay let's introduce ourselves we know exactly now who Adam McKay is and who a lot of the people are that he kind of would align with. And I think that's at least valuable for the purposes of like social communication. So that's one thing that I think is actually really interesting that that I might kind of want to take away. Okay, done with the serious stuff. Dude Abides in the chat said, what you doing when the asteroid hits? Wrong yeah. answers only. I'm grabbing a wakeboard and hitting the coast. Michael, what you doing when the asteroid hits? I'm in a warm shower with my right hand, I'm drinking a tall, cool Pilsner. With my left hand, I am masturbating. <laughs> I thought he said wrong answers only, Mike. Oh, 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 yeah, no, that was wrong because it's real life. Um, wrong answers only. Oh, you know what I would want to do? I'd want to like drive my car off a bridge and just like listen to fucking like Bon Jovi and go to like the biggest overpass in LA and just like fuck it and just like fly through the air and go out on my own accord, not by some <laughs> cosmic bullshit rock. So just, just it. Oh, the whole thing with me in the shower from the record. That's that was weird. <laughs> Helen, totally. what you doing when the asteroid hits? Wrong answers only. Okay, I'm lighting up a fat wrong. joint. Wrong answers. Ah, it's a that's one. wrong. Let, that's no, 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 no. It's not that. That's that's the right part of my answer. No. Um. Let's see. What am I gonna do? So I'm gonna light up a fat joint. I'm gonna smash into some bakeries, and I'm just gonna fucking eat everything Ooh. inside, dude. Everything. Everything that I find. Every fucking croissant. Every like just cake <laughs> that's just like loaded with yeah. sh- just all the fondant, dude. Just and naked, completely naked. Like that's the other. Yeah, it's gonna be great. Wow. Can't wait. Yeah, for I think. I, I kind of like Dude Abide's answer. I'm going to say wrong answer only. I'm going to steal a boat in the harbor and I'm going to charge that wave and go out perfect storm style. Where yes. I'm like, I think that there's hope, you know, where I'm trying to go up over it, but I'm just not going to make it. So, and of course, I'll have already raided all the bakeries, like Helen said, and I'll have all the booze and all the weed. So I'll be absolutely just out of my mind when it happens as well. So perfect. Yeah. Great. Boat death great. All right. All right, let's go ahead and wrap it up there. Um, We're going to take a little break this week from the mailbag, but we'll jump back into it next week. We've got some emails and some voicemails for The Matrix and things. I mean, please keep them coming. Give us your thoughts on The Matrix. And now give us your thoughts on Don't Look Up. 
and uh, we'll go ahead and we'll tackle them next week. But for now, um, I just want to also remind you that you can call us at 1-213-534-8807. That's 1-213-534-8807. Or you can email us, movies at wisecrack.co. That's movies at wisecrack.co. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, go check out our Patreon and become a subscriber if you are able and you want access to that bonus stuff. Check out Culture Binge. Check out all of our other podcasts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Where can people find you on the internet, Helen? I am on Twitter at Helen Flourish. All right, and Michael. I'm on Twitter at Michael O. Burns. I'm also on Wisecrack. And like Austin said, check out Culture Binge. We're starting a whole new era where a bunch of fun new people are going to be coming on. And I will say, because Austin, I'm going to do a plug. Um, two people from the uk kyle lewis will strong they work the autonomy institute they wrote a book for verso called overtime about why we work too much and i sat down with those two and that's the most recent episode of culture binge is me talking to them about their book about work about the philosophy behind why they think we work too much so check it out will is lovely will is actually in our film inventing the future uh there's like a he whole would be. He there's would like be. a there's like a 15 minute sequence where we are in autonomy's headquarters in yep. the uk and will is in there and they're just like brainstorming about cool shit that we can do to create a post-work world he's so, an inch we're totally yeah. inch Wow. <laughs> awesome. And yeah, if you want, you can find me on Twitter, Austin underscore Hayden or Insta, AUS underscore H A Y. That's it. Let's get out of here. Send us out of here, Michael. Goodbye from a comet that's heading towards Earth, which is a really weak allegory for the multifaceted operations of climate change. <laughs> <laughs>